Each year at the conference, we have some di different speakers, students, professors, board members who talk a little bit about the seminary and talk a little bit about its significance in their life. One of our students who is now a pastor, he took a pastorate in Washington State last summer, and his name is Dane Rogers. And so Dane is trying to complete his THM while he is pastoring. So Dane, come on up here. Thank you. I kind of feel underdressed here. This is Washington formal. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, through Chafer, I took a pastorate at uh, uh, Tacoma Grace Bible Church, which was formerly t uh, Portland Avenue Evangelical Free Church of Tacoma, Washington. So you can see one reason why we changed the name was the length. But uh, we also wanted to focus on some of the things that Chafer teaches, which is a stance on grace and uh, God's free grace, which again, it's sad that we have to clarify that it is free. Uh, but that's one of the things that Chafer is doing and instilling in all of its students is uh, the amazing wonder of what Christ has done for us and how to teach that to others who are not getting this sort of education. Uh, I had a, a very influential woman in my life, a neighbor of mine who just passed away this last week. And uh, she's the reason that I'm here at Chafer. Uh, she used to tell me about uh, some of the men who would teach at her church, uh, Lewis Berry Chafer, C.I. Schofield. They would come and speak um, in their brethren churches. So when I grew up and was looking for churches and not finding any good teaching, I started researching online. Where do I find churches that are teaching what Lewis Berry Chafer was teaching my friend Alice? And I found Lewis Berry Chafer's namesake seminary, Chafer Seminary. A couple of weeks later, I was at a conference in Abbotsford, Canada, and I met Dr. Andy Woods, and I knew God was leading to Chafer Seminary. So I am very thankful for the education that we get here at Chafer. I know God is leading many students because when I started at Chafer, there were not many students. They were just starting an online format. And that allowed me to go to Korea and live and teach there for a couple of years while studying. And uh, it's just an incredible ministry what y'all are part of here. And I'm very thankful for it. And I, I tell everyone I meet about Chafer Seminary and we need more pastors taught through seminaries like this. We need more seminaries like this. So uh, yeah, whoever is uh, able to come to Chafer should come to Chafer because we need more teachers who are able to teach God's word. Thank you. Thank you, Dane. Appreciate that. We're ready to look at message number two. This is a wonderful conference and I sure appreciate the, the privilege of being allowed to be part of these three days and the things are in the works that my hope and prayer is that I'll be more closely involved with Chafer Seminary in the future. But let's start tonight by looking at one verse of Revelation 4.11 to put in perspective God as the creator of not just humans but animals and the parts of the world that they will live in. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. And Dr. Ice was talking about how one of the major differences between dispensational theology and the uh, the covenant approach to trying to understand world history is that in dispensational theology the purpose, the overriding purpose for what is going on in the history of the world is doxological. The number one priority of it all is God's glory. In fact, that was one of the solas of the Protestant Reformation. Uh, only to the glory of God. And it, uh, so, which is not to say that we in any way downplay salvation, which the uh, covenant theology folks so emphasize. But ultimately, it's not as much about 
the humans being saved as it is about God showing himself for who he is and how glorious he is. And a real big part of that is him saving sinful mankind, us, with the forgiveness that we get in the Lord Jesus Christ. But there's more than just that. And God is being honored in many other ways as well. And one of those ways is the variety that we see in the animal kingdom and also in the world that the animals live in, which we ourselves live in, of course. Um, in, the, in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord Jesus was talking to a crowd about a topic that he talked about more than once, and it had to do with um, worrying and things like that. Um, in fact, if you look at the whole context, it was obvious that the audience that he was speaking to was a mix of males and females. Because one of the things he said was, don't worry about what you're going to eat. Now, he was looking at the men when he said that. <laughs> and then when he said, and don't worry about what you're going to wear. He was looking at the women when he said that. <laughs> and uh, one of my memories of that was, years ago, I went with a friend and his wife to San Antonio for a, uh, to go to a courthouse to probate a will. And so they dropped the couple, uh, my friend and his wife, we all went in their van, and they dropped off their teenage girls at a, f a friend's house for the couple days that they would be gone. And we went to San Antonio, and we uh, took care of what had to be taken care of at the courthouse, um, returned to the Dallas area to pick up the two children, uh, the two uh, teenage girls, and I still remember one of the girls coming out of the house where she'd been staying during that uh, time frame, and the first thing she said to her mother was, what did you wear to court? And I thought, that's the last thing that would have come out of my mind. <laughs> I might have said, where did you eat in San Antonio? But uh, anyway, <laughs> all right. Well, the Lord said that the flowers that he has made are an illustration of him putting beauty and glory into something. So here's a verse from Matthew 6. And why do you take thought for raiment, for clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. So Solomon on his best day, wearing his best clothes was not as glorious, not for lack of money, because we know that he had the money. He was not as glorious on his best dress day as the flowers that God has put out into the wild. Not domesticated flowers, not roses being grown for florists, but these are just flowers growing in the wild. And God has given them that which produces glory that's far above Solomon on his best day. Therefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, another plant item, which uh, even grasses have little flowers, which is today and tomorrow is cast in the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Now notice the uh, verb there, the, the command verb for consider the lilies. Uh, it, it has the idea of studying, of learning, and it, it's connected to the word for disciple, so it's, it's, it's that kind of serious learning. This isn't just something lackadaisical. This is take on the very serious commitment of learning about the flowers. So for anyone here in the room who's a botanist, here's your verse. It tells you to do what you are doing. And the more that we seriously study what God has made, the more we will see how much glory he has put into things that are so temporary that they're just here for a little bit, and the next thing you know, uh, they're, they're, um, they're gone. Uh, they're cast into the oven in some cases. Uh, so for those of you who uh, want to look at the, the biblical Greek on that, there's your, your verb there. That's your to learn or to study. And, of course, a related noun is the word for disciple. All right, now here's a... That looks pretty much the same, doesn't it? Except for it's not quite the same. Luke, okay, now for comparison, this is the Matthew verse. Look at the verb there, all right, for consider the lilies. Luke describes something similar. Obviously, the Lord Jesus talked about the same topic on more than one occasion. In fact, some of the teachings he gave 
he gave the Sermon on the Mount, that is, it was on a, a hill. And then in another instance, it says he was addressing a group on the plain, which is a flat land, opposite of a hill. And yet he talked about a lot of the same topics. So in this case, he's talking about the same topic, but it must have been a different conversation because he uses a different verb this time. And in this case, when he says, consider the lilies, um, the idea is use your mind to think about what God has done in making these flowers. So use your mind, think through the lilies, how they grow, they toil not, they spin not, and yet I say to you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If God so clothes the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? So we are not to be bothered, fretting, worried, uh, acting as though God is not going to supply our needs. Didn't say greeds, but whatever our real needs are, God will provide those. And he even takes care of flowers, which are obviously not as valuable to him as we are. And yet look at the value that he has put, the beauty that he has put into flowers. This being Texas, of course, we appreciate blue bonnets and Indian paint brushes. Lots of blue bonnets. And blue bonnets are leguminous, so they actually add to the nitrogen uh, cycle by being nitrogen fixers, which is real important for your uh, food cycle. But they look beautiful at the, in the process of doing what they're doing. And uh, there's lots of beautiful flowers in Texas. But it's not just in Texas. Here's a, This will be part of the East Coast where you have mixed forests of deciduous trees, that is trees that leave their that drop their leaves, but first they turn colors before they do, and then often mixed with evergreen trees, as you see in this picture. Maple trees themselves have lots of different colors. So these are all maple leaves here, and yet you have pink and orange and light orange and reddish and yellow and even maroon um, leaves can be from maple. And the interesting thing about uh, deciduous leaves, such as the maple leaves, is that the color is not added at the, at the end of the growing season. That is, the colors of yellow and red and maroonish, purple uh, and pinkish, those colors, those pigments that give those colors, they are contained within the leaves all throughout the spring and the summer. But what happens is, at the end of summer, as you transition to autumn, the green, which is dominant, breaks down. And what you see are these other colors that were already there to start with, but they were masked by the green which dominated during the summer and, of course, the spring. Um, that's kind of like human character. Uh, what kind of character is God building in our lives? Well, until we have a trial, we don't have an opportunity to show on the outside what is going on on the inside. And so trials are like... Um, the season of autumn for leaves. It reveals on the outside what was already there on the inside. Interestingly, uh, 1 Corinthians 11:19, uh, Paul indicates that there is a good purpose for heresies. Because one of the benefits of heresies is it's like those leaves that show what's going on on the inside. For there must also be heresies among you that they which are approved may be made manifest among you. So when some fad comes down the road in Christendom and it sweeps up a whole bunch of churches and they all head in the wrong direction, and then you have a few reliable, solid, Bible-believing churches that stand their ground and go, we're not going to go for that fad. Uh, you have a display of which churches really care about what God said in the Bible and which churches are more interested in what's What's available on YouTube? I say that because, and Sherry's smiling. She knows what I'm about to say. Um, for the last couple years, we've had a, 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 a little family tradition where on Sunday, we, uh, she and I call our son in Ohio, and his three boys are with him. Well, one's a toddler. He's, he's just playing. But the other two are old enough to, to know what's going on. And we have a Bible study over the phone. So what we do is we read one chapter, and we uh, different people on the phone will take turns reading a chapter. So, say, Jack will read 
five verses and Hunter will read four verses and our son will read five verses. And then in between each reading, uh, I'll give commentary and help the boys to understand in their language, you know, what this verse is talking about. And then often Sherry will pray after that. Well, it was coming up on one of those times and we learned from our son that, that um, the, the younger of the two brothers, he was wanting to be on a gadget looking at YouTubes. And his older brother, and how old is Jack? 14. 14. Okay, so the 14-year-old looks at his younger brother and says, You mean you'd rather watch YouTubes than learn the Bible? Like, what kind of an idiot are you? You know, you've got YouTubes and you've got the Bible. I mean, what kind of a choice is that? Anyway, heresies are like that. They give an opportunity to show, you know, which do you really prefer? Which do you really value? Do you value God's Word or do you value YouTube's? Anyway, um, kind of like leaves during the fall. Uh, now, uh, yeah, to, to, uh, to qualify that, YouTube's can be used for teaching God's Word. So I'm not down on YouTube's as a technology, but I know what was meant in that context. Well, thinking about forests. Uh, forests have a lot of diversity, and one of the themes tonight is that God loves variety. And really, doesn't that make sense? Because in the very first verse of the Bible, what do you see? You see that the, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Bereshith bara Elohim et hashemayim et haaretz et hashemayim. It's been a while. Anyway. The point is, the verb, bara, is a third-person, masculine, singular verb. And yet, the subject noun is Elohim, which is a regular, masculine, plural. Not a dual, so not two, not a singular, not one, so three or more. So whoever the creator of heaven and earth is, is somehow so much one that you should use a singular verb to describe his action. And yet there's something plural about this creator being to where his proper name is Elohim, not Allah. Uh, Or, you know, the Hebrew equivalent of the singular. Anyway, the point is, within the Trinity, you have variety. Is it any surprise that the creator has put variety into his creation? into his favorite creation, mankind, we have variety. We have two sexes. I know some folks in America don't understand that, (laughs) but that's quite clear in the Bible. And for most of the world, for most of the history of the world, that's been uh, not something people were confused about. Anyway, so God's given variety there. And then, of course, he's given variety uh, in in all kinds of other ways uh, in the human race. And uh, in fact, to the point that every single one of us is different. Um, I mean, it's like snowflakes. Snowflakes, there's no two snowflakes alike. And how many snowflakes have fallen since since the the worldwide flood in the last four and a half thousand years? How many snowflakes have fallen? And of those snowflakes that have fallen, how many of them have been grabbed before they melted, put onto a uh, a microscope, and looked at and photograph real quick before they melted. Not very many. So the number of snowflakes whose microscopic beauty could be appreciated by human eyes is a very small fraction of all the snowflakes that have fallen in the last four and a half thousand years all over the world. So who's enjoying the beauty of all those individual snowflakes of which not one is the same as another? God is enjoying his creation. He is enjoying the uniqueness, the beauty of each snowflake. And that's just frozen water. And yet each one has a different artistic design to it. What about us? He's made each one of us unique. And how many people are in the world? And how many people who are in the world appreciate who you are or who I am? Not very many. Most people don't know that we exist as individuals. Most people who are alive on the planet don't know who you are, don't know who I am, and they don't care. And then of those very few people who actually know who you are, 
not all of them care about you. In fact, if you're like me, some of them hate you and want you to have something go wrong in your life. Um, anyway, isn't it good to know that God, who not only looks at every single snowflake, whether any human ever gets to see it or not, is looking at our individual lives at the very detailed level, and that he's the one who put all of that uniqueness into each one of our lives. In fact, he didn't just start at conception because he had to be working all along in all the different ancestral family lines that all converge on you, on me. So God loves individuality, variety, uniqueness, and he's put it into the animal world and he's put it into even the non-living world of snowflakes and he's put it into each one of us. So he cares very much about us. It's, he's a very personal God. And we're reminded of the kind of beauty that he can put into life. And this is a fallen world. I mean, even the, whatever beauty we see now, just think, that's in a fallen world. What will it be like in the glorious future when the Lord Jesus restores everything? Um, this is just in a fallen world. Anyway, there's another example of an eastern forest. I think it's Sugarloaf Mountain in Maryland. Why, even the post office recognizes that there's different habitats, that there's variety in our world. So they've got a stamp for deciduous forest, one for the rainforest, and one for the coastal rainforest. That'd be like Washington and southeast Alaska and in the western side of Oregon. Um, you know, m minus the peaceful protests. And then, uh, and then, of course, a pine forest like what you might have in, in East Texas. Uh, the whole idea of, of food webs. You know, when I was a kid, they talked about food chains. Like it was real simple. You know, the grass grows, and then a herbivore eats the grass. And then a carnivore eats the herbivore. And then you eat the carnivore. It's like, that's all there is to it. It made it sound real simple. Anytime anyone tries to tell you that what goes on in creation is simple, you are listening to fake science. There is nothing simple about it. Bacteria are not simple. Viruses are not simple. Animals are not simple. Plants are not simple. Uh, the, the water cycle is not simple. The nitrogen cycle is not simple. The potassium cycle is not simple. There's nothing simple about it. Uh, that's a whole other talk. Okay, another thing that goes on in the, the world of animals and plants is that even in this fallen world, God has a lot of neighborliness. So if, if someone is saying, well, to explain what goes on in nature, it's just all about survival of the fittest and tooth and claw and eat before you're eaten and, and it's all competition, and no, it's not. Uh, yes, there are parasites, there are predators. Uh, there, it is a fallen world. Animals do get sick, animals do die. That is part of the curse. That's what Romans 8 talks about. Uh, but, uh, in, in fact, in Romans 5.12, as, as mentioned in the first session, sin entered the world, not just mankind's race, uh, but sin entered the world, all of Adam's jurisdiction, through Adam's sin. And so, as a result, animals are subjected to the curse. And as Romans 8 points out, they're, they're groaning until the Lord Jesus restores things. But in the meantime, it's not like all we see is curse. We still see a lot of God's goodness displayed in creation. So you could characterize fallen creation as good yet groaning. It's not perfect like it was at the end of creation week, but it is still has a lot of goodness in it, a lot of what God has put into it to make things uh, operate, and yet it's still groaning. All right, so here's the neighborliness. You have squirrels and fungus and fir trees, and they're all working together to help each other. The red squirrels, they plant conifer uh, seeds, that is the seeds from the pine trees. And they also spread the fungus spores. In this case, we're talking about Bryce Canyon, but we could have picked some other areas. And the spores, uh, they, they are the next generation of the mushroom-like fungus that attaches to the Douglas fir roots or it could be pine trees. And what happens is the sugars in the fir roots are uh, available 
to the fungus. And the fungus, because it has a root system that networks and pulls moisture out of the soil, the tree gets the benefit of the water that comes because of the fungus. And the squirrels like to eat the nuts, so the squirrels benefit, the fungus is benefiting, the trees are benefiting, and they all depend on one another. So you could say the squirrels, the fungus, and the fir trees all live like good neighbors in a wonderful cooperative interdependence. It's a lot more to it than just uh, competition. Uh, in the book of Daniel, we notice how important trees are. And we're going to have a couple more uh, examples of how important trees are and how amazing plants are. But in Daniel chapter 4, uh, Nebuchadnezzar is having his dream. The tree grew and was strong, and the height of it reached unto the heaven, and the sight of it to the end of all the earth. The leaves thereof were fair. Leaves are important. And the fruit thereof, much. Fruit is important. Uh, we want fruit trees that provide fruit. And in it was food for all. The beasts of the field had shadow under it. And in Texas, we appreciate shade trees, particularly during summer. And the fowls of the heaven dwelt in the boughs thereof. There's a lot of creatures that have their homes in the branches of trees so that they're up off the ground and they're protected in that way. And all flesh was fed of it. So what good are trees? They can provide timber. They can, uh, they can provide shelter for animals, including bugs and birds. Uh, they provide fruit or nuts or sometimes sap, such as maple syrup. They can provide windbreaks and help reduce soil erosion so that we don't have another dust bowl, like what happened before World War II. They provide carbon dioxide and carbo carbohydrates in general through photosynthesis. Their root systems are part of the nitrogen cycle, which helps get nitrogen uh, out of the atmosphere and into something organic that eventually we can eat and can become proteins, which we can't live without proteins. They provide shade and therefore cooler temperatures and um, elevation sites for aerial viewpoints for creatures that need to live up there. Leaves are not simple. This is just one leaf cell, a diagram of what, what its components are. This looks like something that an inventor would invent. The reason why is because this is something that an inventor invented. The inventor was God. And all of these different parts have different activities and different purposes. And those purposes wouldn't happen if God didn't intelligently design and construct uh, the systems that are necessary to build this thing and to operate it so that it can receive sunlight and can mix carbon dioxide and water and in the process put out a product called a carbohydrate and then also put out a byproduct called... Um, O2, oxygen, that we need to breathe. We and, and uh, animals do. Okay, speaking of trees, the Chinese know about trees. In fact, when they were inventing their language, they understood what is in our Genesis 1 through 11. And so when they were inventing their language, which is not an alphabet-based language, but rather is a pictograph language, that is, it's little symbols uh, assembled together to mean different words. So they take the symbol for God and the symbol for a hand that takes something, and they add that to their symbol for tree. And that combined, in a certain way, uh, which you see, is the Chinese word for to warn, or don't do that, refrain from that. Now look at the tree. Their tree is scientifically accurate. It has both the above ground portion and the below ground portion. It's got the branches above and the root system below. So that's their word for to warn. Interesting coincidence, isn't it, that that reminds you of something in Genesis 2? Well, what about Genesis 3 while we're on the topic? Let's go ahead and look at a couple of those. Well, if you take their symbol for secret and man and garden, notice that's a garden with four quarters, and the word for uh, the symbol for alive, you put all those together and you get the Chinese word for devil. If you take the Chinese word for devil and you combine it with their symbol for two trees, and there were two really important trees at the beginning of the world, remember? There were a lot of trees, but there are two that were especially important. And then if you add the symbol that means to cover something, to hide something, 
you got, you got a devil who's hiding in the trees, and that's the Chinese word for tempter. Kind of reminds me of Genesis 3. At the time the Chinese were inventing their language, the history that we have in our Genesis 1 through 11 was still remembered by those who were inventing the Chinese language. Well, here's another one. We have two trees, and we have the, the Chinese uh, symbol for woman. And when you put the two trees together and a woman, you get the Chinese word for desire or covet. Or another translation is shopping center. <laughs> now, I, that's not true. That's not true. I just made that up. Okay, that, that was a little fake history there. Right? But anyway, all right. Let's take some hands and the symbol for tree, put them together, and you get the Chinese symbol for mulberry tree. Add two mouths to that, and you get the Chinese symbol for to die, to perish. What a coincidence. If you take the symbol for an offender, it's doubled, and a knife, that equals punishment. If you add punishment to weeds, remember the curse was that uh, Adam would have to work hard and plant life wouldn't cooperate you get the Chinese word for thorns, which is the consequence of the fall. Okay, well, that's enough Chinese. There's a, there's a lot more to that. There's two really good books on that. If you ask me about that later, I can, if you want to follow up on that and learn more about that. Um, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's Psalm 1.3. And, of course, the fruitfulness only comes seasonally, but the tree continues to live all throughout the year. And that's the way God works in our life. You know, you think of the, uh, when the Lord Jesus was talking about, I am the vine and you are the branches and you bear fruit if you're connected to me. Well, let's talk a little bit about the inside of vascular plants. Vascular plant means it has some, uh, uh, a, uh, a plumbing system through which water or things dissolved in water, so different liquids can flow, kind of like our blood system. Okay, so we, we have a vascular system, and we call it the cardiovascular system. All right? It's got a heart in the middle, and then it's got all these different um, tubes that go different ways, and, and water mixed with other stuff, which we call blood, travels around the body and accomplishes different things. Well, vascular plants, which is most plants, they also have a plumbing system. Uh, here's a description of that. A tree's internal plumbing system may at first appear uncanny, enabling it to lift water for more than 100 meters, that is um, 300 feet high. In other words, a football, feet high, a football field high. To the top of the tallest tree or out into widely spreading branches and thousands of leaves and then carry liquids back again to the trunk and roots. Now that's really amazing when you think about it. It's fighting gravity sending water and other stuff dissolved in the water, all these different ways, and it's accomplishing what the tree needs to be healthy. And that's a quote from an evolutionist, and so the yellow uh, editorial comment is something I added. In fact, it's much more than uncanny. It's miraculous, blending software and hardware that God put into the original trees on day three of creation week, notwithstanding the willful ignorance of evolutionists to the contrary. I guess I felt insulted by what he said. Okay, now this, would, this is another good quote. I won't read it, but it talks about the different parts of what is inside a tree trunk. And you have the cambium layer and the, and the xylem, which is the, the water's mostly going through the xylem part. And then the phloem uh, portion of it is what's carrying what you might call the food-filled liquids. And so they're, they're going down. So you've got all of this activity, all of this motion, and none of it's random. It's all very um, scoped out and, and bioengineered, and God has it going in a very orderly way. And in the different tissues, you even have, we're now looking at the phloem, you see those tubes have little plates, little, they, they look blue on this uh, image, but they have little holes in them. So this is kind of like a sieve. You know, some, some people uh, put, put the wrong stuff down the sink, and then it clogs up the sink. So someone will come along, they'll put a little sieve plate there so that 
food particles can't go down there and get stuck. And there's just little teeny holes that will allow water to go down, but big stuff can't go down. That's what God put into vascular plants. So you have this long tube through which water and stuff dissolved in the water can travel around in. But you have, uh, every so often, you have a little sieve plate. And they are attached to the insides of the, of the walls. Um, when I was at Wake Forest University, I, I was part of a research project that eventually got published in a science journal about these little bean plants that were being mechanically bumped, they were being bruised on a regular basis to see what would happen to the carbohydrates that were dissolved inside the sap of the little bean plates, bean plants. And this was funded by your federal tax dollars. And the setup was to have a little train track that went around this really big table and it, every so often it bumped a bean plant. And so we had the bump side and the non-bump side of the bean plants and the comparison was what happens to the sap inside the bump side versus the non-bump side. We had fancier ways to say that. You can't get federal research dollars if you say bump side or <laughs> stuff like that. Uh, you you got to say mechanically perturbed. And then you have to describe that the whole process that results from this is called figmomorphogenesis. All right, so if you use... If you use enough words like that, you get federal research dollars. Anyway, this is a scanning electron microscope photograph showing you a sieve plate. All right, so that's at two micro, micrometers. Um, that's what you're looking at. And what happens is that it, when on the bump side of the bean plants, the little branches, um, they get bumped so much that the plant is designed to recognize this is an injured side of the plant. Stop sending precious food sap to that side of the plant. Take some of the carbon uh, carbohydrates that are in solution, you know, dissolved in the water like you'd stir up sugar in water and it dissolves, and cause that dissolved carbohydrates to come out of solution and basically clump up like a blood clot. And so what happens at the sieve plates is the, the plant equivalent of blood clots. And so it stops the flow of sap to the damaged part of the plant so as not to waste it. Otherwise, it would be the plant's equivalent of bleeding to death. So it seals off the, uh, the wasted, you know, where the wasted plant sap would go. All right, now, all of which is to say, there's stuff like this going on inside things that are so common to us, like a bean plant. Would you have ever guessed that this kind of stuff was going on inside a bead plant? And secondly, would you have ever guessed that your federal tax dollars was going to buy toy train sets so that somebody at Wake Forest could bump these little... Whatever. I better move on. <laughs> All right. Tree seeds. Lots of different kinds of seeds for reproducing trees. Look at those different uh, types of seeds. you got acorns, you got little things, you got big things, and they get distributed in different ways. Some just fall to the ground, and that's where they're going to grow. Others have uh, like little wings on them to where when they fall and the wind is blowing, it'll blow them somewhere else. Um, some of them will fall and they will have maybe a, uh, something that an animal likes to eat. The animal will eat it and then part of the seed that doesn't digest inside the animal eventually migrates out the back door of the animal. Uh, but the animal has gone some distance by then and so it ends up being planted with a little fertilizer on it at some location that's quite a distance away from where the original plant put out that seed. Okay, part of leaving an inheritance to your children's children is teaching them about God's glory. And we already um, looked at Psalm 104 in the morning, uh, excuse me, in the afternoon, uh, Psalm 104, which talked about the water cycle. But that's something that uh, grandchildren need to learn about is how God has made all these things and how he has demonstrated his wisdom and his power and his, his ability to make things. Okay, now we're going to look at some of uh, three of the main habitats of America's Great West. And uh, we'll kind of zip through this to look at some illustrations of uh, different animals. So we have the desert on the on the left side and in the middle we see examples of the animals of the prairies 
and then the western forests, that is the mountains that have uh, the evergreens that we see in the Rocky Mountain area. So we call these large zones of uh, habitat where, where there's a lot of similarity, we call that biomes. But we're reminded that the beast of every forest belong to God, and he owns the cattle on a thousand hills. And the forests are filled with different animals, some of which we see and some of which stay hidden when we walk through the forest. So we have mountain forests. Pinion jays are an interesting bird. They like to eat the seeds from pinion pine trees. But they will gather in their mouth many more seeds than they will eat for that particular meal. So they eat a few seeds, and then in their expandable pouch, they'll gather literally dozens of those seeds when, it is, uh, when the seeds are available seasonally. And then they'll plant them in different little hiding places to come back for later because they know during winter I'm going to be hungry, and so I need to come back and retrieve some of these seeds that I've hidden in different places. And so they'll hide many more seeds than they'll ever eat in the winter which means they will come back, they'll, they'll have enough food to get through the winter, and they'll be eating the seeds that they plant in different places. But a lot of the seeds they won't come back for. What happens to those seeds? That's the next generation of pinion pine trees. So these are really tree farmers. And so the, 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 the tree is helping the birds, and the birds are helping the trees to reproduce. In fact, the, in order so that they have something to remember it by, the birds will plant the seeds next to something. So let's say there's a little rock over here on this pathway. They'll plant it next to that rock. Well, that's good because when trees are getting started, the little shoots that come up, that's when they're the most fragile. That's when they're the most vulnerable. And a big stiff wind comes along, blows them right out of the soil, they're gone. But if they're hidden right next to a rock, that rock acts as a windbreak that gives the the little baby tree a chance to get, get uh, firmly rooted to where it will survive the windstorms as it gets bigger. Psalm 104 says, You make darkness, and it is night, wherein all the beasts of the forest do creep forth. A lot of the animals are very active at night, and we don't see what they're seeing. Uh, we, we, they're doing all kinds of things, and they're displaying God's wisdom in how he made them operate, and he sees it, although we don't. Um, Isaiah talked about the thickets of the forest. And so forests, you know, I, uh, they have a lot more than just trees. You know, you got bushes and all kinds of things growing there. Well, we won't look at the different um, math things about which, which types of habitats are more productive in terms of producing carbohydrates per square inch because that gets into a lot of math. And as my wife has told me many times, don't do math in public. You'll, you'll really embarrass yourself. So we'll move on to the desert. And in Isaiah 43, it says, Behold, I'll do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. You shall not know it. Shall you not know it? I will make even a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The beast of the field, that is the nourished land, shall honor me. The tanim, King James translates it dragons, and the owls, because I have given you waters in the wilderness and rivers in the desert to give drink to my people, my chosen. And I'll uh, recognize quickly that that passage in Isaiah is talking about Israel, not the church. Okay, I was listening to Dr. Ice, and I'm not a replacement theology guy. All right, the desert food web. Just a quick uh, point on this because I know we're running out of time. It's really complicated. There's a whole lot more going on in the desert than you ever would have guessed. There's stuff going on underground to keep out of the blazing sun, but uh, uh, there's also stuff going on overground. Look at that black-tailed jackrabbit. What do you notice most about him? Ears. And those ears have lots of surface area. And so to prevent overheating, the warm blood of that rabbit, as it flows up through those ears... A lot of that warmth that's in that blood has a chance to radiate out because there's all of that surface area. And when the blood returns from going out to the tips of the ears, when it returns, it is actually cooler than the blood that entered the ears to start with. And they've done studies on that. I'd, I wasn't part of those, but, uh, you know, you couldn't do any little train sets out in the desert, I don't think. But, <laughs> but uh, God has designed those 
rabbits so that they can withstand the hot temperatures of the desert and not overheat. Um, now, you know that I love uh, birds, and, I, and I, roadrunners are a favorite, and I wish I had time. I'd do you my routine of, of uh, <clears throat> Mama Roadrunner killing the rattlesnake, but uh, the kindergartners love it, but this is probably the wrong audience for that. <laughs> but su suffice it to say that when a roadrunner confronts a Mama, uh, excuse me, when a rattlesnake confronts a roadrunner, the roadrunner could just run away. But she doesn't. A lot of times she decides she's going to go after the rattlesnake. And so here's the rattlesnake coming with his two fangs. And he's jerking forward. And the, and the roadrunner's jer jerking out of the way. And, and then she's got this little do -si do going on for a little while. And then at one point, the roadrunner acts a little bit like I'm getting a little bit slow. You know, jerk. And so the rattlesnake thinks, now's my chance. And so at that point, he strikes really hard. And that's just when the roadrunner is thinking, that's what I wanted you to do all along. And she lunges forward with her beak open and bites him right between the fangs on the top of the mouth. And she's not going to let go. And now he's out there with two fangs that are just touching the air, doing nothing. They're like, what do I do now? <laughs> and I really want this thing to let go of my top of my head. But she's not going to. And so they're going into this wrestling match for a while. And her, she had no way in the world she's going to let go of the top of that rattlesnake's head. And she eventually maneuvers the two of them over to a big old rock. And she smacks his head, smacks his head, smacks his head until she crushes his skull. And she's killed him. And to celebrate, she eats him. Well, I figured I should tell that one after you eat, you know, not before. Oh, well. Um, yucca flowers are pollinated by yucca moths. The moths couldn't live without the flowers. The flowers couldn't live without the moths. That's not what you call uh, competition. No, that's mutual aid. That's neighborliness. That's not, that's not Darwin's idea of how things work. Okay, well, we got the food web on the prairie. The only thing I'm going to mention about that um, is that if you notice the trait that the pronghorn needs to get rid to get away from um, mountain lions or something is speed, because there's no place to hide in the prairie. It's not like you hide behind a tree. You know, there's lots of open fields with grass, so the main thing you need to get away from predators is speed. Whereas um, if you take a a uh, mountain goat, the main thing that they need to get away from predators is agility to be able to go up these real rocky slopes where they only about this much to stand on. And, uh, you know, the predator he's chasing can't, can't handle those maneuvers. So uh, depending on where you live, God gives you what you need to live, and he does that with the animals as well. Grasshoppers. I'm reminded of something on grasshoppers. Some would say that Moses got it wrong when he described that grasshoppers walk on four, four feet, or literally just walk on fours. I heard somebody bring that up once, and they, they thought they'd really gotten one on the Bible. All right, because they say, you know, grasshoppers, they have six legs. Duh. You know, there's a difference between four and six. And yet, that's somebody who did sloppy science. And we'll talk more about that um, on uh, the morning of Wednesday. But um, if you actually watch how grasshoppers walk, they walk on four legs. The front two and the middle two, that's all they walk on. Those last two legs are propped up, and they're used only for jumping, like a catapult, like that. So they walk on the first four, and they leap with the last two. And that's actually what Moses said in Leviticus 11.21, where he said that they walk upon four with benders, and that is the way that they leap, they take a, a bent joint and they spring it open. With benders from above its feet, four to leap by them. That is a very literal description of exactly what grasshoppers do. Anyway, that's just to illustrate that the more we study creation carefully, the more we see it matches what God said. Well, if we had time, we could go into how wonderful the, new, the nitrogen cycle is. Or we could really get excited talking about dung beetles. Um, dung beetles are great, and in the process of them rolling up their little ball of dung that they take from place to place, they will pick up seeds, 
and so those seeds will travel from one place to another, and with the added fertilizer, those seeds will eventually sprout, and so that's how God disseminates some seeds from one place to another in order to do things. There's a lot of beauty that is still there on the earth, even though it's cursed. In Chichen Itza, in the Yucatan part of Mexico, there is a temple of idolatry there called, well, the place is called Chichen Itza, and they call this the uh, Temple of Kukulkan, but it's where they did blood sacrifices. I won't tell you how horrible what they did was, but suffice to say, a lot of very devilish stuff happened on, on that structure for many years. And yet, just within walking distance of that structure is this bird right here, the turquoise-browed motmot. So if you ever happen to go to Chichen Itza, if you, uh, in the, about the middle of that picture, you see that, that um, Tower of Babel-looking thing, that structure, the Spanish called it El Castillo, uh, Temple of Kukulkan is what the Mayas called it, and that's where they sacrificed humans. But if you... Uh, look with your eye toward the top middle edge. You see a little blue there. That's a sinkhole, uh, a sainoti. And if you were to walk toward that sinkhole just before you get to the water, if you look to the left in the trees there, that's where they have turquoise browed motmots. Somebody told me to look for that when I was there, and sure enough, they were. I mean, aren't those beautiful birds? They look like a pipe cleaners for the end of their tail with, you know, like little fans on them or something. But anyway, in the midst of human ugliness, God is still putting out beauty. And uh, he's, he's doing a lot of that. Well, I think we're about out of time, so let me say a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for being the God who loves variety. That you, you have put variety into our lives. You've made each one of us unique. You care about each one of us and watch our lives and all the details more so than anyone else on earth. In fact, you understand the details of our lives more so than we do ourselves, and uh, many times over. Thank you for caring about our unique lives and for being our God who wants beauty for our lives and can take us through uh, ugly things and through your redemptive grace can make something that, that honors your Son and can produce results, fruit that, that is honorable for eternity. We thank you that you have even put your creativity and your bioengineering wisdom and your beauty into plants and animals. And you have, even in this fallen world, arranged for there to be a lot of good. And we just thank you for that. We don't want to look at the world and fail to see your handiwork, and your glory in what is all around us. Uh, even if it's the grackles in the parking lot of a shell station. And uh, we just thank you for being our God in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know if we're supposed to have Q&A or... Yes. We are. Okay. I didn't get out of that one. Oh, well. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Uh, the beauty of this universe is unbelievable, particularly this uh, earth on which God has placed us. Questions, please. Anybody over here have any questions? Comments? Yes, sir. Since I live in Albuquerque, I enjoy the road runners, including in my front yard. I haven't seen a rattlesnake be attacked, but I have seen a road runner in the yard pick up a snail and hammer it against a rock and break it open. Mm -hmm. And I thought, how did that thing manage mm -hmm. to do that? Mm -hmm. It's amazing to see God's creation. Yeah, rats, scorpions, all kinds of things you don't want in your house. We like to have a road run around our house. You got any questions over here? No questions? I just want to thank you for 
your presentations because it just shows the detail of God's creation. Just amazing, his omniscience and, and what he's created. And, you know, you, you would never see it unless you got somebody like you who digs in, does the research, and can show us. So thank you. Yeah, it's it's, it's a, a real privilege to to look at the details of things that God has done. Jim? Hello. Oh, that's me. Um, okay, so this is about diversity, but it's not totally related to your talk, but maybe you can comment on it. So I have uh, encountered the argument that like homosexuality and other sexual relations is just a form of God's variety. How do you respond? Uh, I mean, I know ways to respond, but how would you respond and have you confronted this question? Uh, I have, and the Bible makes it real clear exactly what variety God wants for the human race. And so when it comes to sex, there are two categories, and it's male and female, and that's clearly taught from Genesis 1 through the whole book. And God has proven that it's not because that's the only way he could do it, because there are other creatures that he's made that have a different uh, way of, of reproducing. And, I mean, there's even um, there's a bacterium that has more than two sexes. And, and this is just a one-celled animal. I mean, it's not even an animal. It's a one-celled uh, living thing that God has made that doesn't have a nephesh. And uh, so there'd be no problem with eating it before the fall <laughs> if you happen to be a bacteria eater. But, uh, and, and, you know, that's what some things floating out in the ocean eat is bacteria. But, uh, and God has certain shellfish that go from one sex transition to another, and then maybe transition back again. So God certainly had the ability as a bioengineer to make the human race that way if he had wanted to. The fact that he chose not to and the fact that he was very specific in his written word that this is what I want, this is what I have defined, this is what I've decreed, and if you go against that, you are committing horrible sins. And he's made that very clear in both the Old and New Testament. So that's how I answer that question. It's not just any kind of variety. No, it's the specific variety, variety that God ordained. Anything, anything other than that is sin. As the French once said, somebody was talking about how there really isn't all that much difference between male and female. And, uh, and the one Frenchman said, uh, that may be true, but... Viva la différence. <laughs> Long live the difference. <laughs> and uh, that's a message for America. <laughs> I feel like I have to wash my mouth out with soap. I, I just spoke French. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I've been to uh, Chichen Itza, and it's... Um, it's a contrast. Mm -hmm. They have gargoyle-looking, grotesque mm -hmm. uh, th things there, cut out of stone and all. Mm -hmm. But it's a beautiful setting. Yeah. They have these stairs going way up, and yeah. and right back behind it is a beautiful green sea. Mm -hmm. And it's just the contrast of the beauty that God made mm -hmm. and how depraved man can be. Did you go at the time when you were allowed to climb to the top? Mm -hmm. Okay. They sense if disallowed that because some woman, some woman lost her footing and fell to her death down the stairs. It's a very steep staircase. They yeah. weren't good architects. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's a real good contrast of the wickedness of mankind and the beauty of God. Yeah. It's... Any other questions over here? All right, well, Jim, thank you very much. Thank you. That was fascinating. Thank you. Thank you.